thank everyone for coming and um, just to welcome you all and we thank you for your participation we thank um, all our locals who came out and we thank everyone here that connected I think that's um, one of the main goals that we have in order to break us from this cycle that um, we need industrialized food production um, to start a little bit about PBCCG, we began, I guess, about four years ago. We started a citizens group, and that was when a gentleman put in an application for a 4,400-head um, swine capo in our township. And when they put it in, I really didn't know um, what a confined animal feeding operation was. I went to a community meeting, um, did a lot of research, and what I discovered um, absolutely horrified me. Uh, from there, I will say my life has not been the same since. <laughs> um, it's been very busy. My table is consistently filled with paper constantly. You cannot find, I mean, it, it's everywhere. And I don't know where my husband is, but God bless him because uh, there's not many people who would put up with the, the schedules and the things that it, it just absolutely consumes you. Um, when we did start fighting against this, we went to zoning hearing meetings and we brought in experts, um, people that could testify about the public health, about the contamination of water, about the contamination of air, um, the effect on the rural communities, the local economy, um, how basically this is nothing that's going to benefit our community, it's going to basically benefit one person in the community um, who really often finds that they don't even benefit. It's a handful of corporations. So um, the fight has taken us many places. The community group, our citizens group, has raised over $80,000, which is pretty amazing for uh, Delta, those who know where Peach Bottom Township is. It's a very small township, a couple thousand people. Um, and we fought it, we, we did hold them back from putting in a 4,400. Um, however, they did put in 2,450 swine in one building. And just so you can get an idea of how much waste we're talking about, that one building will actually produce more waste than our entire township of 4,000 people. Mm. So if you think about that, then you realize the problems when it comes to trying to get rid of this waste. The land can take so much and give so much. So um, now I'm gonna introduce, this is someone that actually was the first one um, who really stepped in and helped us and taught us how to fight this fight. This is someone who's been doing this for decades. Um, Terry Spence is from Missouri. Terry is a beef cattle farmer and I'm going to read you a little bit um, about Terry, about the bio. Okay. He owns and operates a second generation family farm in northeast Missouri near the Iowa border. He was born and raised there. He's been active in the factory farm issue since 1993 when the Missouri legislature exempted three counties in northeast Missouri from complying with the state's anti-corporate farming law and allowed the raising of swine by a corporate entity in his area. Along with this exemption came 1.7 million hogs, with 80,000 of them near his farm. Terry's the president of Citizens Legal Environmental Action Network, CLEAN, and of Family Farms for the Future, and is a certified level three volunteer water quality monitor for Missouri Stream Team number 714. He's been active over the last 10 years in organizing and working with groups throughout Missouri and various other states which are facing the factory farm problem. He has presented testimony before the U.S. House Subcommittee on CAFOs and at numerous Missouri Clean Water Commission hearings, Missouri Air Conservation Commission hearings, and has also worked with various environmental organizations on a state and a national level. Terry's been involved in litigation involving CAFOs from the local circuit court, Missouri Court of Appeals, and U.S. Federal Court, which entailed a federal suit under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Uh, he is presently involved in a class action lawsuit against the second largest producer in the United States. Terry was selected as one of the 30 heroes for each of the 30 years of the Federal Clean Water Act. 
and recently received the 2010 Justice Award from the Missouri Attorney General for dedication and commitment to environmental protection and has been featured in the Boston Globe, New York Times, Audubon Magazine, several books, and various other state and local press. Terry is an independent consultant for the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project, which focuses on working with rural citizens and groups throughout the United States and Canada that are being impacted by industrialized agricultural operations. The SRA project also includes the renewable, renewable excuse me, harvest project that focuses on sustainable alternatives that benefit small farmers and rural communities. On a personal note, and I told Terry this the other night, I look at these biographies and I look at all these um, initials after them and all these years of dedication and experience. And the one thing that doesn't come through is, and I will say this, the heart of every person here that is speaking today. Each one of them has helped us um, in a significant way. And I will say that Terry actually flew from Missouri for a five minute public comment at a supervisor's meeting because they would not let him get on the agenda just to support the community. I see the mouths dropping. This is what these people are and it's, I love them. They're family and there's a place in my heart that nobody will ever get because they're all incredible. come to and you know I appreciate the kind remarks uh, from Maria but Maria is also special to our hearts and the projects we work on. <laughs> she is a person that's that's dedicated. Uh, you guys are all precious. The qualities of life that she strives to, to work with in your communities uh, is outstanding in, in my opinion. So you have a wonderful resource here and you know we're backing Maria uh, and, and all that we can do because it's important to us what happens in Pennsylvania and um, everywhere else across this country so thank you also for Maria for for having us here uh, I have been engaged in uh, the cable battle for for 15 years uh, it's been a long haul and after the recent election uh, we probably just got set back about seven of those years or more so you know but we keep striving we keep moving forward and uh, uh, we're right on this issue uh, today I'm not really going to talk about uh, the factory farm issue as much as I am uh, the integrity of our food supply and Kathy's already got that up there when thinking of integrity uh, you know a lot of things comes to mind but what comes to my mind is is honesty something that's sincere and genuine, something without deceit, not broken or damaged, and complete within itself. So as, as I go through this presentation this afternoon, uh, and a few slides that I have, I want you to keep in mind uh, at the end of this, and determine in your own mind if, if what you see and where our, our food standards are today is something that's good for your family and, and your rural communities. Over the last century, uh, agriculture has made many changes. Uh, from the small mid-sized farms that uh, uh, produce uh, local sustainable products and also in the processing sector, uh, many things has changed over the last century from those small farms producing a product that was locally grown and locally uh, placed before the consumers in that region. All these changes hasn't come without a cost when you take a look at our food integrity. And as I go through some slides today, uh, hopefully this will point out, you know, the change that has taken place from sustainable independent uh, producers to the industrialized system that we have today. Food integrity is, is really uh, defined with three principles. One is uh, the production method on how uh, the animals, the food is produced. Uh, the second is uh, the processing techniques on how it is processed and, and delivered. And the third principle is usually uh, regarding the inspection service or the USDA aspect on, on the food labeling and how it is delivered also. On the production method side of it, 
what has changed and what has occurred is animals that's normally raised in a uh, natural environment. And what has changed in that aspect is that most of the animals today are confined in an unnatural environment. It's changed from animals consuming food from the natural elements of the soil and the environment to an unnatural situation in confinement where they are fed byproducts as dietary substitutes. It's also changed in animal health, where animals normally, uh, from the soil, the, the minerals, the elements, uh, retain their health, to now to confine animals situations where they are fed pharmaceuticals and stuff, so they can stay in those unnatural. Uh, the next four slides kind of represents the changes. Uh, I don't want to rehash things. Uh, I think the first one, if you want to back up. I did that one. Okay. But you'll notice in these, the top are usually the sustainable, the free range operations. And if you'll take a look at the animals in, in, in all four cases, that they are out in the air, they're out on green grass, uh, they're being rewarded by the elements of the soil, the healthy soil, uh, for their minerals. Uh, sunlight, the whole aspect where everything else in the confinement situation is, is not a good situation. And of course the dairy cows that you just previously seen, those on grass isn't that happy cow in, cow, cow in California that you see on the milk commercials. Mm -hmm. uh, she's in kind of a place there that's not natural from where she comes from. 